the thousand people who are here this evening for this Filson event. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Richard Clay, and I'm the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us this evening for this latest and wonderful installment of the Gertrude Polk Brown Lecture Series. This lecture series was initiated in 1993 as a memorial to the life of Gertrude Polk Brown. It's made possible by the continuous and generous philanthropy of her daughter, Dace Brown Stubbs, and her grandson, Garvin Brown IV. This, yeah. The series has brought internationally recognized historians to Louisville. More than 35,000 citizens have learned more about the significant stories of our region, our nation, and our world because of the Gertrude Polk Brown's lectures. The Filson is most grateful for this generosity. Tonight, I am honored to introduce Mr. Steve Inskeep. Steve Inskeep is a co-host of NPR's Morning Edition, the most widely heard radio program in the United States, and of NPR's Up First, one of the nation's most popular podcasts. His reporting has taken him across the United States, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, Pakistan, and China. His search for the full story behind the news has led him to history. And he's the author of Instant City, The Life and Death of Karachi, and also of Jackson Land, President Andrew Jackson, Cherokee Chief John Ross, and the great American land grab. Inskeep was raised in Carmel, Indiana, and he graduated from Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Kentucky. And you'll love this as well. His first professional experience in radio was a stint as a sportcaster at WMKY-FM in Moorhead. Steve was hired by NPR in 1996, and his first full-time assignment was the 1996 presidential library uh, uh, primary in New Hampshire. So please join me now in welcoming Steve Inskeep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and the applause and the welcome. It is great to be back in the state of Kentucky. It is awesome to be here. Uh, I owe a lot to this state. I learned a lot in this state. Uh, the introduction is correct. I went to Moorhead State University after growing up in Indiana and graduating from high school. I decided that I wanted to get as far away from Indiana as I could imagine. <laughs> Now that sounds like a joke, but really that was about as far as I could imagine myself going at that time. I had read books about the whole world, but the idea of really going out there hadn't occurred to me. But it turned out that going to Kentucky for that time was where I needed to go and plenty far enough, and I'm grateful to be back. Moorhead, I should mention, um, there's a memoirist named Chris Offutt. He's a wonderful writer, and he went to Moorhead and went back years later for a while as a, as a teacher, a professor, and then he wrote a memoir about his experiences in which he described Moorhead State University as a high school with ashtrays. <laughs> Chris is less popular in Moorhead than it used to be, <laughs> but I still like him because I think you have a sense of humor about things, and it was a fascinating place. I'd come from this suburban kind of background. Uh, my parents were, were school teachers. Uh, my dad was a coach, and this was at the edge, as you know very well, the edge of uh, coal country, and, and every year at Moorhead, I've been back for the graduation since, every year at Moorhead, they say everybody who is the first in your family to graduate from college, please stand up and half the class 
half the class does. So it's good to be back. I uh, got into the Louisville airport this afternoon, and the first thing I noticed was uh, was uh, an ad for Bullet Bourbon. And next to another big ad that said, this is the taxi for your bourbon. And then I continued out, and next to security is a giant billboard size ad for bourbon. And then there was a bourbon bar. I went in. I did not have a bourbon, but I got a fried chicken sandwich. And then I went on to the hotel, which is a wonderful hotel where the Filson is putting me up. And there's a gift shop with two shelves of bourbon. And I thought, this is, wow, this is really, there's a theme developing <laughs> here. And I, it might make me uncomfortable, but then I thought, no, they just understand that I've just come from Washington, D.C., and so maybe I, you know, they just figured I might need something. So everything is, is set up. Yes, you may applaud that. Thank you very much. There is a little bit of news in Washington. We've been a little bit busy. But I'm glad to be presenting this book to you this evening because I feel that Imperfect Union is the backstory, an earlier version of the news that we're living now, an earlier version of the country, at a time when Americans were arguing over what it meant to be an American and establishing the very borders of America that we argue over how to secure now. That's what was being established then. And we collectively, Americans, were having arguments in the same government that we know now and sometimes in the very same buildings. It's been amazing as a journalist to have gone to the United States Capitol where an impeachment trial is going on this very afternoon, and then to go to the Library of Congress and read the details of past events in the United States Capitol. In 1850, in one event in Imperfect Union, uh, a Mississippi senator named Henry Foote prepared for his time in the Senate by packing a five-shot pistol into his coat because he was on his way to insult another senator, Thomas Hart Benton, who, among other things, had killed a man in a duel. He ended up, Foote ended up pulling the pistol on the floor of the Senate, which caused Benton, who was unarmed, to walk toward him screaming, Shoot me, shoot me. Someone got the gun away from him and locked it in a desk. But these were tense political times. It was a divided America. The 1840s and 50s is when the story is set, the years, the decades before the Civil War. Imperfect Union is the story of two people who rose to incredible fame in that time. John Charles Fremont, was the husband of this husband and wife combination. He was an explorer of the American West. That's going to get in your way if I put it there, right? Don't want to get in anybody's view. <clears throat> it's so scenic. John Charles Fremont was an explorer of the American West. He went west leading expeditions. He was a U.S. Army officer who would hire civilians in St. Louis, Missouri and go west on the Oregon Trail. And he would map the trail on his way west. And he went on other expeditions as well across the Sierra Nevada Mountains in winter into California. In 1845 and 1846, he went over those mountains into California with 60 gunmen and began the process of capturing California, taking it over on behalf of the United States. So he was an explorer, he was a map maker, he was a latter-day conquistador. But one thing to know about his work as an explorer was that as explorers go, he did not discover all that much that was new. What he did was publicize and inform. He would make good maps of the Oregon Trail and then he would come back east to Washington, D.C., and he would write lyrical, beautiful reports describing his adventures, fighting against the wilderness, going across the Rocky Mountains, surmounting uh, mountain peaks, crossing deserts, and more. And these would be excerpted in newspapers and even published as popular books for the general public. They were best-selling books. He was a best-selling writer or the equivalent 
of the day. He was publicizing the West. That actually was his purpose. He had been sent there by his father-in-law, a powerful senator, Thomas Hart Benton, the guy who yelled, shoot me! That guy uh, wanted to entice Americans to go West because that would help the United States occupy the territory, solidify its hold on the Louisiana Purchase, and ultimately confirm U.S. possession of what was called the Oregon country, which was disputed with Britain. Senator Benton knew that if enough Americans moved there, that it would fall into the hands of the United States, and the United States would have a Pacific coast and could open a seaport aimed at Asia at the markets of China and India, that could be done through publicity because people had to be enticed to go west. John Charles Fremont had a particular talent for publicity and he told his story in a particular way. It was all a first person narrative. His maps only mapped countryside that he himself saw. If there was ground he didn't cover, he left it blank. And his story only reported what he himself saw, a step-by-step -step narrative of his experiences. And that had the effect of ensuring that John Charles Fremont was on every page and in every scene. And as he was making the West, excuse me, <clears throat> and as he was making the West more famous, he was making himself more famous. He became one of the most extraordinarily famous men of his time. There are still signs of that today. If you've ever heard of Fremont, California, or you've been to Las Vegas and been on Fremont Street, attending or going to the casinos, or like the Fremont Street experience. If you <clears throat> ever have been to Wyoming, you might climb Fremont Peak. If you've ever been outside Monterey, you might climb the other Fremont Peak. You can go to Fremont, Nebraska, the home of Senator Ben Sass. You can go to Fremont, New York, Fremont, New Hampshire. There are Fremont streets all over the place. This man became so famous that in 1856, he was nominated as the first ever presidential candidate of the brand new Republican Party. Now I know that it is hard to believe that someone could be nominated for president in the Republican Party simply because he's extraordinarily famous and has his name on many things. <laughs> but it happened once upon a time in America. There's another main character in this story, and I'd like to read a little bit about her, because the most important factor in John Fremont's fame may have been the person who made it possible for him to take full advantage of both his talent and the times. Jesse Benton Fremont, his wife, born when women were allowed to make few choices for themselves, Jesse found a way to chart her own course, the daughter of a senator who was deeply involved in the West, the guy who said, shoot me, that guy. She provided her previously unknown husband with entree to the highest levels of the government and media. It was no coincidence that his career began to soar a few months after they eloped, when he was 28 and she was 17. I thought as many others did, said one of their critics, that Jesse Benton Fremont was the better man of the two. She helped to write his famous reports and some of his letters, serving as secretary, editor, writing partner, and occasional ghostwriter. She amplified his talent for self-promotion, working with news editors to publicize his journeys. She became his political advisor. She attracted talented young men to his circle, promoted friends, and lashed out at enemies. She carried on conversations with senators twice her age, offered her opinions to presidents even when they did not agree with her, and was gradually recognized as a political force in her own right. Her timing was as perfect as her husband's. She was pushing the boundaries of women's assigned roles just as women were beginning to demand a larger place in national life. In the 1840s and 50s, women were holding conventions to call for voting rights 
and also campaigning against slavery. The Republican Party, founded to oppose the expansion of slavery, captured some of their energy. And when John was nominated for president, Jesse became part of the campaign in ways that no woman ever had. Her husband's campaign literature featured songs of praise for Jesse. It nearly seemed like they were running for president. Again, who could imagine that in America there would be a husband and wife team that would seem to run for the highest office in the land? Women attended campaign rallies in 1856. This is 1856, even though they could not vote. Thousands of Republicans flocked to the Fremont House for a glimpse of John on the balcony and then refused to leave until they saw Jesse too. Madam Fremont, they cried. Jesse, Jesse, give us Jesse. A newspaper said she could have been elected queen. Jesse Benton Fremont achieved a celebrity much like her husband's, with fame out of proportion to her accomplishments, unless we count her husband's fame among those accomplishments. Because they worked together to create his image and eventually her image. They were working through a rapidly expanding news media. This is a time when weekly papers were becoming daily newspapers, and there were more and more of them in city after city, and they were more, more closely connected than other before. In eight, ever before, in 1844, Samuel F. B. Morse demonstrated an invention called the telegraph, running copper wires on poles with the bark still on them from Washington to Baltimore, and suddenly those cities were connected with instant communication. The Democratic National Convention was held in 1844 in Baltimore, and an operator in Baltimore sent regular news updates down the line to Washington to the United States Capitol, where Samuel F. B. Morse himself interpreted his own Morse code and read aloud news updates to an ever-increasing crowd of people there. He was the first news anchor. When you read in the Library of Congress or wherever you may find them, newspaper accounts of those days, you see people who recognize that they are witnessing a profound change in the human condition. One newspaper man called it a new species of consciousness, the ability to tell with certainty what was happening at that very second in a distant city, which might be 50 or 100 or 500 miles away. Who knew what the world could be like if you could find out what was happening anywhere, instantly? You read that and you realize that they were living in the dawn of the age that we are experiencing now and they had some of the same frustrations. Instant news would seem to bring people together, but sometimes had the tendency to bring people apart. In this tense time leading up to the Civil War, if there was a violent and divisive incident, the news would spread instantly north and south, and then would be filtered through partisan editors, and there would be a northern version and a southern version of the same story. And then the telegraph would reveal to each part of the country how demented the point of view of the people on the other side was. And it pushed people apart. But the Fremonts were very talented in using the expanding news media and in framing what they did. Now, I don't mean to suggest that John C. Fremont did nothing or achieved nothing. He was not one of those celebrities without function. He was not a, I don't know, Kardashian, anything like that. The first thing he did was go out on real expeditions, which took real courage and involved real risk. Although John C. Fremont was the kind of individual who would sometimes add to the risk. The first major expedition he commanded was in 1842. He was supposed to go to the Continental Divide, starting in western Missouri, near what is now Kansas City, Missouri, and going up and along what's called the Oregon Trail and reaching the Continental Divide. But when he got there, it was kind of anticlimactic. 
In fact, the slope was so gradual in this mountain pass that he had a little trouble identifying just where the Continental Divide was. And so he decided to climb the highest mountain he could find. This was beyond his orders as an army officer, but he sort of had mountain climbing on his mind ever since he stocked up the journey. And so he took a number of men, 14 of them, I believe, and they got on mules and they went up the highest of the mountains they could see in the Wind River chain in what is now Wyoming. They got part way up the mountain. It seemed like they were most of the way there. It was August, but they were getting to the altitude where there was snow up on the mountainside, even though the sun was out and it was not, not that cold, didn't seem that cold. The landscape was getting rougher and rougher. They seemed near the top, so they decided to leave their mules behind. And with their mules, they left their supplies and their food and even their coats. It didn't take long to understand that they had misread the ground ahead of them. What looked like a direct ascent concealed more valleys that they needed to navigate. They were reaching altitudes where snow covered the ground even in August. And one of the men nearly slid off a snowy slope and over a precipice to his death. He saved himself only by dropping flat on the surface to gain traction. Exhausted in the thin air, the party stopped for the night just below the tree line, around 10,000 feet above sea level. They tried to hunt a mountain goat for dinner and failed. They tried to sleep without their blankets on a slab of bare granite. Lieutenant Fremont began to experience severe headaches and to vomit. His leadership grew erratic the next day. He let his party lose cohesion as they clambered uphill across broken ground. They split into ones and twos, taking divergent routes through the rocks and snow, which meant they could not easily help one another. The mapmaker Preuss was walking alone at the top of a snowy slope when he lost his footing and began sliding. There was no way to stop. He continued some 200 feet before he crashed into rocks at the bottom and was lucky to somersault over the first rock in a way that broke no bones. Afterward, Preuss was found by Johnny Auguste Janice, the Black Voyageur, which was the name, the French name, for some of the men who were along with him. Janice brought word that Lieutenant Fremont was vomiting again, as were at least two others. The doubled over Fremont had sent a message telling Preuss, the map maker, to try to reach the summit alone. Janice had brought the barometer, which they used to measure altitude, expecting that he would accompany Preuss and help him determine how tall the mountain was. Preuss refused, took a barometric reading where he was, and descended back to where Fremont was resting. They did manage to get some food up the mountain that night, spent another evening there, Refreshed by their first meal in nearly two days, the men rolled into blankets around their fires. Preuss, the map maker, expected that in the morning everyone would descend the mountain, but he woke to discover otherwise. John reminded him that they had brought a bottle of brandy. Well, Mr. Preuss, I hope we shall, after all, empty a glass on top of the mountain. That was the sick and dehydrated lieutenant's way of saying, that he intended to keep climbing. They did make it to the top of that mountain in 1842. Remarkably, none of Fremont's men were killed. On top of the mountain, they unfurled an American flag and planted it at the summit. It was a little like the moon landing in 1969, they were on top of the Rocky Mountains, on top of this grand summit, looking out over the distance with a visibility, it seemed, of hundreds of miles. And Lieutenant Fremont decided, without evidence, that he must have climbed the highest mountain in all of North America. Made it back to Washington, and with Jesse, wrote a report in which he said, with a couple of qualifications, it seemed like they had climbed the, he had climbed the highest mountain in North America. And this became part of his extraordinary fame, part of his legend. 
14 years later, when he ran for president of the United States, it was still a big part of his legend. And when you look in campaign biographies that were made to support his candidacy and tell his story, there are pictures of him climbing the highest summit in North America, the highest summit in the Rockies. It was part of his image. Later research and exploration revealed that the mountain he had climbed was not in the top 100 <laughs> mountains in the Rocky Mountain chain. But not too many people had climbed up with barometers on the other ones at that time, and so nobody knew it. Nobody knew it for years. It was this mixture of genuine accomplishment with a little bit of flim-flam that made them famous. And I say made them famous because Jessie did gradually become famous. She was the daughter, as we said, of a senator. Shoot me, that guy. She uh, was the second child. The first had been a daughter. And Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri had in his head that the second would be a son and that he was going to name this son after his father, Jesse. It turned out to be a daughter, but Senator Benton was a stubborn man, and so he named her Jesse, just changing the spelling slightly. And Jesse wrote in a memoir, my father gave me early the place a son would have had. She would follow him along when he went hunting in Virginia. When he shot a bird, she would remember carrying the game bag with the limp, warm, dead bird in there. When he went to the United States Senate to work, she would tra trail along after him, and he would put her in the Library of Congress for safekeeping. She had memories, even as a little girl, of going with her father to visit the President of the United States. The first president she met was Andrew Jackson, who took office when Jesse was not quite five. And so she grew up amid the elite of the nation, the elite anyway of Washington, D.C., and she grew up around politics. And she was well educated by a father who encouraged her to be educated in a way that would have been more common for a boy in that age. She learned multiple languages. He would help with this. He would read aloud to her in French and challenge her to translate and follow along. In a way, you could think of her as wanting to be a man. She wanted to go beyond the gender roles that were required of people much more rigidly at that time. As a teenager, her schoolmates began getting married off. Now, I, I heard people's uh, sounds of concern when we said that uh, there was an 11-year difference between Jesse and John. When Jesse was about 16, one of her classmates, who was not far in age from her, was married off to the 40-something ambassador from Russia. And Jesse went to the wedding. She was a bridesmaid, and the bridesmaids were all very young, and the groomsmen were all very important older men. Jesse, when the bridesmaids and groomsmen were paired off, was on the arm of Senator James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. She found the entire experience gross. In a memoir at the end of her life, she wrote what happened next. After the wedding, she cut off her hair, went to her father, and said, I want to check out of Washington society, and I want to live life as your assistant. This, she said, was the moment when her father ceased to be quite so tolerant of her interest in acting like a man, and told her that Men would be more attractive to, attracted to a woman of the long-haired variety. And so she did get married and have children and fill that traditional gender role in every respect, staying home for months or years at a time while her husband was off and away. And yet she managed all the same to fulfill part of her ambition to do something more, to do things that were supposed to be restricted to men. She obeyed her father 
while also being independent because she eloped with this penniless army lieutenant, John Charles Fremont, who was on his way up in the world but was not yet famous and who had no money and was not the type of person that the senator would have liked his daughter to marry, but she did it. She could not become her father's assistant, so she married a man who was destined to assist him in his effort to make the West and the Pacific Coast an American coast. And she continued to sit in on some of his official meetings and to help him with his work while also helping her husband become more and more and more famous. He eventually know, was known, among many other things, as the conqueror of California because he had ridden with those 60 gunmen into California just before the start of the U.S. war with Mexico and was involved in the conquest. Afterward, the Fremonts moved to California for a time. John, during the war, while fighting the war, had acquired large amounts of California real estate, as one does when fighting a war of conquest. And gold was discovered in his land during the gold rush in 1849. They became extraordinarily wealthy, as well as extraordinarily famous. John was briefly a United States senator, and then in 1856, John and Jesse maneuvered together adroitly toward the Republican nomination. This campaign is not very well known, but when you read about it here, I think you will agree that it feels very relevant to now. It feels very current to 2020. This campaign has a lot to say about America and a lot to say about our situation now. We are in a time in America of great demographic change. Certain groups of people in the country are growing more rapidly than others, people of color, immigrants, and so forth. And because they tend to vote more often for one political party that is seen as very destabilizing, and the backdrop for a lot of the division that I've come from in Washington or that we feel in our own neighborhoods is the demographic change of the country. You have Republicans who fear not just losing an election, but losing for all time. President Trump was explicit about that in his 2016 campaign, in which he told supporters, this is your last chance to save the country before it's flooded with illegal immigrants who will be legalized and allowed to vote. You now have Democrats who fear not just losing an election, but losing for all time in the face of a president that they feel violates all the rules. And it is when you have people who fear losing permanently that people go to extremes politically. The 1840s and 50s were such a time because there was a great demographic change. The country was divided north and south, states that had gradually abolished slavery and states that had in fact embraced slavery more firmly. And the northern states were growing much more rapidly in population, which meant they gained increasing political power. It appeared they had a chance to gain even more power as the new territories of the West became states. California entered the Union in 1850 as a free state. And this demographic change is the key to the creation of the Republican Party. It is the key to the ending of slavery in the United States because by the 1850s, the mid-1850s, the difference in population between North and South was so pronounced that it appeared to be possible that a president could be elected with Northern votes alone, without a single electoral vote, even without a single vote from anywhere in the South. And this is what Republicans attempted in 1856. John Charles Fremont was the first person to attempt this. It was an incredibly bitter campaign. Fremont was the illegitimate son of a French immigrant. Jesse had attempted to hide the part about the illegitimacy. She went seeking evidence that in fact her, his mother and father were married and when she could not find that, 
she took over from the biographer who was writing a campaign biography of John. She wrote the first chapter and wrote that his parents were married after all. The epigraph of this book, by the way, is a quote from Jesse Benton Fremont. It would hardly do to tell the whole truth about everything. Well, the opposition press in this bitter campaign found out that, in fact, he was illegitimate, which was considered much more shameful at the time than it would be considered today. And then the opposition turned him from the illegitimate son of an immigrant to an immigrant, saying that he was born outside the United States and was therefore ineligible for the presidency. There were birthers in 1856. And that was not enough. They also began saying that he was an adherent to a dangerous and alien religion, Catholicism. This was a time of a massive movement against not just illegal immigration, but immigration period, a movement against foreigners, a movement against Catholicism, fear and paranoia that Catholics were going to be used by the Pope or somebody in Europe to take over the United States. And so these were enormously damaging charges. We know there was not a President Fremont, so I'm not destroying a lot of the suspense to tell you that they lost. And I say they lost because John and Jesse, of course, were in a way running together. She was one of the managers of the campaign. But they set an electoral strategy that was followed four years later by the next Republican nominee for president, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln prevailed, as we know. The South found this such a threat that they vowed to destroy the system, seceded from the Union and fired the first shot of the Civil War. And this is why I make the case in the rather long subtitle of this book that the Fremonts helped to cause the Civil War is because of their role in bringing about the creation of the Republican Party. They were there for that. They did that. They helped to bring together the Republican Party. Even though John's reputation declined in later years, so much so that many people who had supported him for president said, thank God he was never president. They felt that he had done a great service to the country by being nominated for president. And by playing that role in forcing a necessary change upon the United States, a great leap forward in human progress. The Fremonts had frustrating later lives. John had a bad civil war. He argued with Lincoln. No one has ever come off good in history after arguing with Lincoln. By the way, I went running over to your Lincoln Memorial this afternoon. It's beautiful. You should be proud of that. It's a lovely, lovely spot. Yeah, go ahead. But they had a bad civil war. In the Gilded Age, John lost the gilding. He blew their fortune on railroad investments, and they lived their latter lives struggling on the edge of poverty. It was, in a way, a benefit to history because one of the ways they managed to make a living was by writing. Jessie, who had helped him write so much, began writing memoirs under her own name. And they are beautiful and charming and, and different and worth reading even today. John, who had spent so much time away from her going west, finally went with her all the way west. They moved to Los Angeles. And then this man, who had been some, in some way damaged by his experiences, I think, could not remain in Los Angeles and left her to go back east and died in New York City in 1890. She lived into another century, to 1902, and had help because people recognized her role in the history of the country. And when word spread of how desperately poor she was that she could not pay the bills, women in Los Angeles collected money to buy her a house where she died in 1902. Her estate included two paintings, 
which had hung over her writing desk in her final years. One was a portrait of Jessie as a young woman. The other was of John as an old man. She had loved this painting of him, weathered, bearded, and white-haired. It had been made by a young artist to whom Jessie had become something of a patron, John Gutson Borglum. Some of you know that name. The artist, a son of immigrants, had been born at Bear Lake, Idaho, near the Oregon Trail that had helped open the region for settlement. Later, his family moved eastward to Fremont, Nebraska. The artist was in his early 20s when in California he had the opportunity to paint the great explorer, and in Borglum's hands the old man seemed gentle, vulnerable, his face translucent against a background of darkness. Afterward, Jessie supported Borglum's career, not with money since she had so little, but by making use of her name to write him letters of introduction to the wealthy and famous. Borglum went on to live in Paris and New York and became known as a sculptor who once created a six-foot bust of Abraham Lincoln. In 1927, invited to expand upon this theme, John Fremont's former portrait painter accepted a commission to carve the faces of Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson, and Theodore Roosevelt on the side of Mount Rushmore, a project that occupied the remainder of his life. Today, John Charles Fremont's name is on two mountain peaks, one in Wyoming and one in California. If Borglum had ever considered carving Fremont into a mountainside, any sculpture true to life would have to show many faces. The faces would represent those who had buoyed him, men and women, white and black and brown, who together changed the country. Men of many races were on his missions to the West, Frenchmen, Germans, African-Americans, Indians. The sculpture would show the men and women who roared his name in 1856 and laid the foundation for progress and defeat. Near them would be the immigrants who had taught him map making and had gone along with him to make his maps of the West. There would be Jacob Dodson, the son of black servants who went on multiple missions with them, holding steady while other men went mad in the snow. Above all, there would be Jesse Benton Fremont, who worked to build John up until he seemed as large as those figures on Mount Rushmore. Jesse, who made the man he, she loved, and then, little by little, lost him. The book is in perfect union, and I'm grateful that you came here tonight. Thank you very much. We have time for questions, and the two mics are on either side of the stage. I realize that's a bit hard for those of you in the middle, but as you as you're making your way up if you have questions feel free to just just come on up and I'll start out with one to give people time and that and and I'll um say up front I my wife and I listened to the book uh, on audible as we were driving talk to them if you would about Jesse's um encounters with Abraham Lincoln Thank you very much. And just so you know, um, you can write down your questions, and the Chief Justice will read them. <laughs> or maybe not. The Chief Justice may decline to read them. We'll blow the whistle on somebody. Yes, uh, John Fremont was appointed a general in Missouri by Abraham Lincoln at the start of the war. It made political sense because he was a Republican. It seemed to make military sense because he was this great hero who actually had never commanded a large number of men. And it was a very difficult situation in Missouri. He didn't do very well as a general. The situation became desperate, and then Fremont in 1861 
issued a kind of emancipation proclamation. He declared freedom of the slaves of any disloyal citizens of Missouri. Lincoln was not ready to free, had not yet freed any slaves, was not ready to do it. He was worried about losing slave states that were still in the Union. He was especially worried about Kentucky. And he sent word to Fremont to please modify this order or change it or drop it. And Fremont, being a rather stubborn individual, review, refused. The standoff went on for weeks, and then, rather than follow the order of his commander-in-chief, allowed Jesse to go from St. Louis on the train back to Washington to tell Abraham Lincoln what was what. She has an account of this meeting in a letter. She got to Washington. She checks into uh, her, or stops at the house that she has there, and she sends a, a note to what we now call the White House to ask when the president might like to see her. And a note comes back from Lincoln with one word, now. She goes over and makes her case that this emancipation thing is great. It's working in Missouri. It's going to play well in Europe where they're against slavery. It's just the thing that Lincoln should go along with. And he says, you are quite a female politician. And then stop listening to her, she says. And not long afterward, her husband was fired. It's still a remarkable story because it was one of many instances that she quite confidently went and confronted presidents with whom she disagreed. All right, I welcome questions here from the front. Uh, this gentleman was here first. Let me just ask you to say your name uh, and go for a question. We'll get as many as we can. And I see that there are men who've lined up here. There are women here tonight. Are there women here tonight? I think there are women here tonight. Yes. Could we have some questions from women? I don't know if you've noticed. I'm a guy, so it's good to have like different different kinds of people. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm Christopher White. Hi. Um, the uh, did Jesse Benton bring any wealth to that marriage, and did the elopement cause fallout, domestic fallout within the family? Yes, or? absolutely. Senator Benton was outraged by the elopement. Uh, but had to get over it because it was his favorite daughter, and he also had business to conduct with um, with his new son-in-law. And so finally, after a number of weeks, he did place a notice of the marriage in the paper. But there's something notable about the little item in the paper, because it does not say John C. Fremont marries Jesse Benton. It says Jesse Benton marries John C. Fremont. He put her first, as I did in the in the subtitle of the book. Hi, go ahead. Hi, Hi there. I was wondering if you What's your name? Case Farr. Okay. I was wondering if you could tell me why Jesse's dad had a beard with that guy. Yeah. You bet. Um <clears throat> Are there any women who want to ask questions here, guys? But I will answer your question, sir. Um, Thomas Hart Benton moved to St. Louis, uh, Missouri in about 1815, and he was a slave owner, which is an important thing to know about him. Even though his daughter and son-in-law were the face of an anti-slavery party, even though he in some way supported their point of view, he never supported their party and never stopped owning slaves during his lifetime. And in 1817, he got into a number of quarrels, arguments with a uh, lawyer. Benton was a lawyer, and this other guy is a lawyer, and they're arguing in court, and they're arguing outside of court. And the uh, other guy accuses Benton of having, to fa having failed to pay taxes on his slaves, on his human property. And so Benton challenged him to a duel, they rode out to Bloody Island, this little island that was in the Mississippi on the border between Missouri and Illinois. And so by custom, people pretended that neither state's law applied there, so you could just kill someone. They shot at each other from 30 paces. They each wounded the other. They went away. The guy insulted Benton some more. So he challenged him to another duel at 10 paces and killed the man. It's a remarkable story 
He was not a nice man. He was erudite. He was a loving father and yet also a slave owner and a killer. Um, and that, I think, represents the complexity of history and the complexity of the American story. We have a story that is filled with terrifying and horrible acts. Westward expansion with which the Fremonts were so closely connected involved the displacement or killing of uncounted native peoples and native nations and the loss of land and the capture of land from Mexico, any number of horrible acts. And yet what has been created through that is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And part of the challenge we face as Americans is to understand both parts of that story to its fullest extent. And that's what I try to do through my, through my writing. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, thank you. Thank you. We'll make this the last question. Thank you. I'm Rainy Johnson Levin. My question is, how did Jesse meet such a man of such a very different station in life? Um, I would say because John was ambitious. John had been a kind of apprentice, a second in command on a couple of expeditions out to the West, came back to Washington to make the maps, and first met Senator Benton, because Benton was engaged in the West and interested in the West, and Benton uh, came by this office to look at the map, and this young army lieutenant was there and was kind of embarrassed because at that point the map was blank. It's a big black, blank map, and and Senator Benton said, can you find Ukraine on that map? No, wait. <laughs> Sorry, wrong story there. Um, it was a blank piece of paper. And Lieutenant Fremont was a little embarrassed, but he knew that he had just made a connection and worked his way into the Benton family and asked out Jesse's older sister. And they went together to a school concert. And Jesse was there. And John was attracted. Or Jesse was attracted to him. And they were the ones who, uh, they were the ones who got together. It was a long marriage, in many ways a successful marriage. I think also a difficult marriage because he spent so much time away and was such an erratic individual in, in many ways, which is why I call the book Imperfect Union. It's a description of the marriage, but also of the country at that time divided between free and slave states. And it comes back to that theme that I mentioned before, which I guess is a good theme to end on. The struggles that we face, the awful situations that we deal with sometimes as a country are hard to comprehend in the moment. But when you take a longer view, when you go back in time to the 1840s and 50s and see what has happened since then, it allows us to imagine a hundred years from now or a hundred fifty years from now and imagine what may yet be. Now, 150 years from now, people may look back at us and be horrified by some of the things that we did, just as we look back upon slave times and are horrified. How could people do that, even though many of them knew it was wrong? It is possible that 150 years from now, people will look back on us and pose a question like that. How could they possibly understand the science of climate change and continue driving gasoline-powered cars? But there's also that possibility over time, the possibility of progress. Thank you very much.